Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Ephesians chapters 5 and 6 in our continuing study of the Pauline epistles. Throughout this section, we've been reminded of, uh, Paul says, here's how you used to live, uh, but here's how you are now to live. And you say, well, what does that look like? The answer is given here in chapter 5 and verse 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love even as not only, not, it doesn't say yeah, even as God loved you, but even as Christ also loved you. So you notice the, the, the connection, uh, be imitators of God. Well, what does that look like? Look at Jesus. Uh, and he loved you. Not only did he love you, he gave himself up for us. And now we have a description of what that was all about. An offering and a sacrifice to God, Christ's death, the death of Jesus, when he gave himself on the cross, was a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Now, when you look at the cross, you say, well, I can't smell that. But remember that when you, when you approach the sacrifice in the temple, that you saw the sacrifice, you gave the sacrifice, you, you would touch the animal before it died, and then once it had died and been placed on the altar, they would, they would burn it. That's what you, the idea of a whole burnt offering, a, an ascending offering, it would sort of go up in smoke. And think about the, what you smell when you go into a steakhouse. Now, I'm assuming you're not a vegan or something like that, uh, where, but just think of the aroma. And that it smells quite sweet. Now, I guess if it's burnt really badly, it doesn't. But, but the idea here, uh, he has become both a sacrifice and a sweet-smelling aroma for us. Verse 3, but fornication, and here's some of the things that you used to live in, but fornication and all uncleanliness or, or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is proper for saints, uh, nor filthiness, nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not appropriate, but rather giving of thanks. And so instead of that former manner of life, fornication, uncleanliness, covetousness, um, the, way you, the way you talk, the way you joke, rather let your mouth and your words be that which are appropriate, that which give thanks. Verse 5, For seeing this, you know that no fornicator, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater. And we, we notice over in Colossians chapter 4 uh, the linkage between the covetousness and idolatry. Uh, and here I think the link is even stronger. So um, covetousness is a form of idolatry. Uh, and, and as you read this, you might think, well, I'm not a fornicator, and, and I hope you're not, uh, or unclean, but are you covetous? Are you unclean on the inside? Because that's, that is idolatry. And notice, those sorts of people, none of those has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You say, well, how can I possibly be saved? Uh, th that's talking about what I think. There's times when I think wrongly. And that is why we need a Savior. Let no man deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of dis disobedience. That's, that is that from which you have been saved. Now live accordingly. Live uh, the life to which you have been saved unto. Verse 7, Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly, uh, uh, you were formerly darkness, but now light in the Lord, walk as children of light. So we've been brought out of darkness. Darkness is where you can't see what you're going into. If you've ever been in the dark, you, you run into anything, um, and that's painful. That's, you know, you, you can go in all sorts of directions. You can have all sorts of wrong ideas about your surroundings. But we have been brought into the light so we can see things as they really are. Now live that way. Verse 9, for the fruit of the light uh, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, demonstrating what is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Now that you have the opportunity to, to see right, walk accordingly. Don't go bumping into things, <laughs> those things that hurt you. Verse 11, so notice we had the idea, walk as children of light and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather even reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. So look, don't go coveting after those, those old ways, those ways of darkness. Uh, you, you don't really want to make that a part of your life any longer. Verse 13, but all things, when they are reproved, are made manifest by the light. Now, again, the, this light theme, for everything that is made manifest is light.
You want to see uh, what's good and appropriate? It's in accordance with the one who is light. Therefore, he says, and we have a quote from the Old Testament here. It's actually two passages thrown together, Isaiah 26, 19, and also Isaiah chapter 16, verse 1. Uh, here's the, the amalgamation, the, the gathered quote, Awake you who sleeps and arise from the dead, and Christ, of course, that's a reference to the Messiah in Isaiah chapter 60, and Christ shall shine upon you. Verse 15, look therefore, caref- look therefore carefully how you walk. Remember, we said walking has been the big theme in chapters 4, here again in chapter 5. Uh, look carefully as you walk, um, not as unwise, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. doesn't mean the 24 hours are evil, but, but we're in bad times. And Paul was in bad times. And so therefore, make this life count. In fact, he says, therefore, be not foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Remember, in a previous class, we talked about when you see the will of the Lord. It can either refer to all things that God has determined, that, that's God's will. He works all things according to the, to the counsel of his own will, he said back in Ephesians chapter 1. Um, but here, when he says, understand what the will of the Lord is, I don't think it's talking about primarily, it may include that, but I don't think it's talking primarily about what God's overall plan is, but what are his commands for how I am to live right now? So understand how I am to live right now. That's his emphasis here in verse 17. That's what it means to understand what the will of the Lord is. Verse 18, he continues, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is wastefulness. Um, Now, remember, they lived in a culture back then where water wasn't always good to drink, depending on where you were getting it from. Uh, so sometimes you drink wine instead. My my older brother actually lives in Germany, and when he, when he first went there, there was a little bit of a cultural shift. Uh, he was out playing soccer, and he came in, and he went to get a glass of water. And his host said, you can't drink that. Uh, here, have, have a glass of wine instead. Um, but notice, be not drunken with wine. So they're not, not to be uh, the Bible doesn't ever speak against drinking per se, but it does speak against drunkenness. And by the way, if you have a problem with alcohol, then the best thing to do is don't drink anything at all. Um, but be not drunk with wine, uh, but instead, notice, be filled with the Spirit. Don't be filled with the spirits, you know, the, uh, the alcohol, but be filled instead with the Spirit. And then he describes what that looks like, speaking a one to one another, one to another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Uh, I think this is describing perhaps one of the early church services. Um, and, and yes, I, we can probably sing to one another when we're not in church, but when we're gathered together, that's part of what we do as we are filled with the Spirit, is we speak and encourage uh, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, uh, singing, making melody in your heart with your heart to the Lord. So we're, we're speaking to one another in that way, singing, making melody, But then notice, and be subject to one another, this is verse 21, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, over the next rest of this chapter and on into the next chapter, he's going to talk about what it looks like to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That happens not just in the church service, but it also happens, I think it does happen in the church service too, uh, where we can be both encouraged and hear uh, not just the pastor, but hear one another uh, speak and encourage and sometimes exhort. But it happens throughout the rest of the family and society as well. And that's what we're going to, going to see in these verses. Uh, he begins in verse uh, 21, wives, be subject to your husbands. Uh, now notice that that word be subject in uh, verse 21, um, if you look in your Bible, if you're reading uh, either King James or New American Standard, the words be subject will be italicized because it doesn't actually appear there. He, there. He's borrowing it from appropriately in verse 21. So be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, the way you do that is to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, so there, there's a call for wives to be subject to their husbands. Um, but he's going to speak in pairs. So first wives, then husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now notice this is not conditional. It doesn't say wives be subject to your husbands as long as they're loving you. It doesn't say husbands love your wives as long as they're being subject uh, to you. No, uh, you're called to do it as Christ loved the church. Christ didn't wait until we started loving him. We started obeying him. 
No, he loved us and gave himself up for us when we were disobedient. And, and he walks us through what that looks like and, and makes the connection. We're not going to go over those verses right now. Uh, but some wonderful verses showing, uh, quoting from Genesis chapter 2, the first marriage, and showing how that actually pictures our relationship with Jesus Christ. He has become, in a sense, our spiritual husband. And then we get to chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. I uh, probably ought to mention that the culture uh, in which they lived in the, in the first century regarding children and parents was very different from what we have today. Um, oftentimes we look at this through 21st century eyes and we think children, maybe that's you know little ones, and then you grow out of that by the time you get to your teens. And, 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 uh, but in the ancient world, especially in the Roman world, uh, they lived in what we, they called the pater familiaris. Uh, that is, the, the father was the head of the family. Even when the family were grown and, and even married, uh, there were times in Roman culture, I, don't, I can't think of a place where the Jews did this, but in Roman culture where a, a father came home and said to his grown married son, um, you're getting a divorce today. I have a new wife picked out for you. <laughs> and and now they didn't do that all the time. Um, but but that that's the kind of strength that a father had over the family. So when it says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Don't think just little kids. Um, may, I think we ought to think beyond that. Um, now, notice it's in the Lord. You know, when, when the father's telling you to do something that's sinful or wrong, then you, you have to respectfully say, well, no, that's not right. Um, but I think this is maybe stronger than we have made it out to be. Um, and then notice the, the correlation. Fathers, do not provoke your children. Don't say things unreasonable. Don't, don't tell your, your married child, uh, hey, you're getting a divorce today. I picked out a new spouse for you. No, don't do that sort of thing. Um, so fathers, do not provoke your children. And then uh, we see next, slaves, be obedient to your masters. Um, and uh, that, that was spoken of in a day of slavery. We don't have slavery. I don't think we should return to that. I think Philemon actually gives us some, some hints about uh, God's, uh, God's uh, desires concerning uh, that. And when I say desires, I'm, again, speaking in the sense of commands and what, he, what he's called us to do. Uh, I think we are correct in that. Uh, Slaves, be obedient to your masters. And then he addresses the masters too. Uh, do the same things to them. What? Be obedient to the slaves? Well, in a sense, notice this is being subject to one another. Masters, give up threatening, give up some of your rights. You have the right to you have the right of life and death over your slave in, in the ancient world. But no, give up that right as you are subject to one another in the fear of Christ. And then he adds, uh, both slaves and masters, you both have a master in heaven. Verse 10, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Now, we usually sort of pass over that verse where uh, we're going to read about the whole armor of God and what that looks like, and, and we sort of imagine uh, Paul in a prison, and he's uh, looking at Roman soldiers, and gee, he's got a breastplate and a, and a sword and a shield, and um, sort of imagining this. I, I think we miss something when we skip over this verse. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That is the armor, because he's going to know, speak about the, putting on the armor of God. The armor is his armor. Be strong in him. And what Paul's going to do is take us on a walk. It won't be a walk through uh, a Roman soldier and looking at his armor. It's going to be a walk through the Old Testament. As we look in the Old Testament, what is the armor of of God. Put on that armor, the armor that he gives, but also the armor that he wears. And that's what we're going to see in the Old Testament, that you may be able to stand uh, against the wiles of the devil. Now, we've been talking about the walk of the Christian uh, in chapters 4, in chapter 5, uh, throughout the, up, right up to this point. But now it, we're going to change our metaphors. Instead of our walk, we're going to be reading about our stand. And that's going to be the, the repeated refrain that's going to come in these closing verses of Ephesians chapter 6. So that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that is, the attacks, the plans, the schemes uh, of, the, of the devil. For our wrestling is not against flesh and blood, but instead against the principalities, against the powers, against the world, world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our fight, and yes, we are in a war, 
But it's not a physical war, <laughs> not flesh and blood. It's against the unseen, the powers, the world rulers, not the world rulers you think that are there, <laughs> not the Nero, not the, um, you know, th think about whoever you don't like in politics right now, not against that person, but against the power behind him, against the spiritual reality behind wickedness, notice, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, don't miss any part, that you may be with, able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, and notice, uh, both to withstand, but now, again, to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth. And already we're into the Old Testament uh, when he speaks about girding your loins. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, this is speaking about the Messiah, uh, about the one who comes and uh, also righteousness will be the belt about his loins um, and faithfulness, the belt about his waist. And so this idea of having your loins girded, that's an Old Testament idea that describes the Messiah. And you dress the same way, with the same armor, with his armor. So stand therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Uh, so we, we had the loins, but now we move to the breastplate. Uh, Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 17, uh, again describing uh, the coming of the Lord. He put on righteousness like a, like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. We're going to see that too. Uh, and he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. According to their deeds, so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands he'll make recompense. Now think about this. Paul's writing this to the Ephesians. Can I call him this? He's writing this to the coastlands, <laughs> to the people that are not in, in the mountains of Israel, but the people that are out there in, in the rest of the world. Um, that have now come to Christ. And they are being called to dress, to dress, can I say dress for success? <laughs> to dress in the way that the Lord himself is dressed. So righteousness like a breastplate, a helmet of salvation on his head. We're going to see this imagery. Uh, stand therefore, notice, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod, next in verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 7, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace and brings good news of happiness, who announces salvation, says to Zion, your God reigns. Uh, so again, dress in the way that calls to mind the, this imagery from the book of Isaiah. Um, stand therefore, he continues, verse 16, in, taking, in all taking up the shield of faith, um, with which you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. Um, so there's the shield of faith and take the helmet of salvation. We just saw it in Isaiah making reference to that. And the sword of the spirit. And then you say, well, what does that represent? Um, the word, which is the word of God. Now, when he says the word of God, a slightly different term, you, usually, not always, but usually when you talk about the word of God, it's uh, the lagu uh, tothia, the, the, the term lagos is used. But this time, ha esten rema theo, uh, rema is the word that's used for the word. Now that can still be used of, of the word of God, in other words, uh, the scriptures. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's not that, but perhaps there's a little bit of a bigger idea behind this. I say that because again, Isaiah, and that's, that's where we've been finding all of these uh, allusions to, uh, listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named me. He has made, and here it is, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. Now, what made the mouth like a sharp sword? Uh, in that it could speak judgment. Of course, it's speaking the word of God, so I'm not saying it's, it's not part of the word of God. But it's the picture of speaking judgment, speaking in a cutting way. Uh, remember how in the book of Revelation, uh, Jesus is come, uh, is described coming both in uh, chapter 1, but then again in uh, chapter 19. Uh, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. 
uh, picturing the judgment of the nations. Uh, he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. He has also made me a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant Israel. This is uh, describing what, it, what the people of God do, Israel. Uh, out of their mouth come a sharp sword. Uh, as they speak the word of God, and it brings salvation to those who hear, but judgment to those who do not. Uh, you're my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. And of course, the ultimate Israel, the better Israel, is Jesus who came and is the word of God, both speaks the word of God, but but exemplifies that in speaking the the judgments and the, the truth of the Lord and in fulfilling that, in becoming that for us. He is the very communication of God. So you have this whole picture of the armor of God. Like I said, you know, I don't think Paul's der- deriving it so much from the Roman um, uh, soldiers that have him in captivity, but rather from the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, the loins girded with truth, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, uh, the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. Now, I, Ephesians chapter 6, we already saw, having girded your loins with truth, Isaiah, righteousness will be the girdle of his loins. Ephesians 6, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, we saw Isaiah chapter 59, uh, the, he'll, have, he'll put on breastplate uh, righteousness as a breastplate. Um, the helmet of salvation, chapter 6, verse 16, we saw the helmet of salvation on his head, chapter 59, verse 17. The sword of the Spirit, we looked, he made my mouth like a sharp sword. Uh, all of these from Isaiah. Stand, therefore, and that's, that was the initial command, with, wearing all this armor. Verse 18, with all prayer and supplication, praying at all seasons. So notice this, this prayer idea, praying at all seasons in the Spirit and watching in all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. We haven't finished the sentence yet. Uh, this, is, this is the prayer part. Verse 19, and he continues that that supplication be on my behalf, that utterance may be given unto me in opening my mouth. Remember that Paul is awaiting trial in Rome, uh, and uh, there's coming a day when he's going to come before the Roman authorities, before the very emperor. He's appealed to, to Caesar, to Caesar he's going to go, and he will be giving the gospel to the Roman emperor and to all that are gathered, uh, in, in the, all that are present. And so he asked that utterance may be given me and open my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. And so he's asking, uh, this is the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains, that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Uh, He wants to make sure, it's not about, you know, saving his life, it's about speaking forth the truth that he might serve as the ambassador of the heavenly kingdom here on earth. He's coming to a different kingdom, and he's going to be representing the Lord, and he wants to do that with boldness and truth in love, (laughs) but he wants to make sure he gets that right, and he asks for prayer for, uh, for that purpose. Now, verse 21, but that you may, that you also may know my affairs and how I do, because Paul really hasn't talked about himself uh, throughout this epistle, about his own experiences, what he's going through. He's, he's made a couple of references to, to his imprisonment and to uh, just now uh, the fact that he's going to be speaking. Um, but he is sending Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister uh, in the Lord. He's going to make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for this very purpose, that you may know our state and that he may comfort your heart. So any personal notes, this is like a footnote, see Tychicus, <laughs> he'll bring you up to date. We come to the close, uh, last two verses, peace be to the brethren. Remember how we started grace and peace? Well, we're going to actually end on the opposite notes, note, opposite order. Peace uh, be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to verse 24. We're going to actually pause here for a second. Uh, we had peace. that Now it's grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. And my focus is going to be on that last phrase, with a love incorruptible. Notice how the words a love are in, they're italicized. Uh, that's the translators letting us know uh, they were trying to be helpful. And so they inserted that word, 
uh, the second time, you actually have it the first time, uh, with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ, with and the Greek word, en aftharsia, um, with, uh, actually not with, in love, oops, that's not, not there, in, in corruption, in, in, in um, let's see, what's another term for that? In unspoiledness. <laughs> that's the same term that's used over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when, when Paul talks about how we will receive a body that is incorruptible, that is non-decayable, that is non-killable, that is immortal. And so I'm not trying to change the, the meaning of the word so much because that incorruptible works nicely, but instead how it connects with the previous clause. You see, the King James Version uh, says, Grace be with all them that love our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice they have the in right, in sincerity. When sincerity is okay, because if you're, if you're loving in sincerity, you're also loving in, in corruption and, and uh, in that which is not decaying. Uh, you know, it's not a decaying love. So that works, sort of. Um, but I think maybe there's a bit more here. Instead of describing the quality of love, it might be describing the location of the love, which would take us full circle. See, back in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, we started off, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Notice, in the heavenly places. It's not saying that he hasn't blessed us other uh, where uh, uh, other areas, but he has blessed us in the heavenly places. That's the location where we have our blessings, where we have our possession, where we have all that we have in Christ. And now we come full circle. Grace be with all those loving our Lord Jesus Christ in, well, I'm not going to say in the heavenlies because that's not what the word is, but in immortality or in incorruption. In other words, it might not be describing the nature of the love, because let me just be frank, I don't think any of us have loved Jesus um, with a love that has uh, not a little bit of decay in it. We are Even our love is, is fallen. But the location of our love, that's not fallen at all, because we are in Christ. We are in the heavenly places. And so therefore, even my love, which really doesn't measure up, has a new meaning to it because of its location, not because of how good of a lover I am. And that is where I find grace.